Searchers began showing up at 3 a.m. on Saturday, the 21st of June. Park Superintendent George W. Fry shut down visitor traffic to Cades Cove in order to keep the roads clear for new volunteers coming to the base of operations. The Cades Cove picnic area was to remain closed until further notice. The military and experienced searchers were taken up the mountain first. Two additional helicopters were sent, and the combined air fleet carried 600 people to higher elevation search points. The search was aided by six helicopters in total, two of which were the Jolly Green Giant model that had been used in Vietnam to transport wounded soldiers. 700 people were also taken up by jeep to Spence Field up Boat Mountain Road. The area around Spence Field was completely saturated, as well as the other nearby mountaintops. About 100 to 200 people were sent out on foot from Cades Cove to check the low ridges and creek drainage points. McCarter wrote in his journal that morning, quote, We traveled by bus up Laurel Creek Road to Cades Cove, where two Chinook helicopters and four other small choppers are airlifting searchers to the mountain helispots. I have never seen anything like this before. With a large number of both military, park, and volunteer civilian searchers, and all of the vehicles and equipment to service them, it looks like an invasion is being launched, or an evacuation is underway. At 10 a.m., Snedden called the media to tell them to let people know they had more searchers than they could handle. The total force for that day was around 1,400 people. To this day, it remains the largest search ever launched in the Great Smoky Mountains. Hi, I'm your host, Zach Williams. Welcome to Compulsion. Snedden started the day off, assuring the media that there was still a chance Dennis could be alive. Quote, There's always hope at this stage of the game. There have been many instances of survival beyond this date. Naturally, the hope becomes dimmer each day, but we haven't given up by any means. Famed psychic Gene Dixon called in to get the media's hope up that day as well, by saying the boy was, quote, still breathing as of Friday night. Snedden gave the papers a detailed rundown of strategies for the day. He said that searchers were going back over areas that had already been looked at, as the terrain was so dense, he worried they might have missed something. Quote, We're going back and starting over, because when you stop to think of the 56-square-mile area in this search, I don't think anyone could say we've found every nook, every hole, and every cranny that the little boy could be in. He said that Dennis may have fallen off of a small cliff or gotten stuck in a rock formation. He said he'd instructed all search parties to look into every small cave, crevice in a rock, or thick bush, because Dennis likely would have sought shelter due to all the rain, and he probably wouldn't be out in the open. He also said that small groups of more experienced searchers were going to widen the search area a bit, but the focus of the day was going back through the established area with a fine-tooth comb. There was less chaos than park officials had been expecting among the more amateur search teams. One rescue squad member broke an arm when he fell through an abandoned bridge, but other than that, there were very few serious injuries. Despite the help of 1,400 people that day, they found no trace of Dennis. Snedden said, quote, It's as if he had vanished from the face of the earth. We don't have a shred of evidence as to what happened. That night, the military forces met to speak with the governor and ask about keeping at least one type of helicopter and at least 200 troops on the search through the next day. There were fewer searchers that Sunday, but still well over 1,000. McCarter wrote of the vast numbers that, quote, the number of searchers today is less than yesterday, but there are still more people than we can use efficiently. Much time is wasted with personnel standing in line for everything from transportation and food to toilet facilities. 
Everyone is very frustrated, and some, who have been searching for over a week now, are discouraged. Nine more Green Berets came in, bringing their number to 71. Numerous rattlesnakes and copperheads were killed by searchers, and one Green Beret cooked and ate one. In an attempt to put less strain on resources and get more practice surviving off the land, other Green Berets started following suit, killing small game. The Green Berets killed and ate many of the snakes they came across, and one was spotted wearing a rattlesnake's head tied around his neck. Rangers tried to ferry people up by jeep, but stopped after one jeep slid off the road. Searchers and park officials started once again re-graveling Boat Mountain Road to keep it safe. Once the morning mist cleared, helicopters brought about 500 searchers to Spence Field, Russell Field, Thunderhead, Bone Valley, and the Fontana Dam area. The general coverage area was 56 square miles, and the intensive search area was 12 square miles. At the end of the day, nothing was found. Bob Miller contacted the media and told them, after the day's search, that the block on Cades Cove would be removed, though the search would still be ongoing, so visitors were asked to please respect the searchers. The military told the media that the 200 Air National Guardsmen would be sent home, as it was the end of their summer tour of duty, but they would be replaced with 150 National Guardsmen, and they would continue to help with providing communications equipment and helicopters. William told the media that he was very grateful for the efforts of all involved. He said he, quote, can't really express the gratitude my family feels. They're searching just like it was their own kid. Snedden seemed to think the weekend had been their last chance to find Dennis. Quote, I thought Saturday morning when I got up that this is the day, but it wasn't. I felt like this morning it had to be it. But we have uncovered nothing. We checked out every report. We even checked out a Ouija board report, but it produced nothing. We found a lot of tracks, and we have carefully investigated each and every one, but each has been discounted. The next day, search parties had been more than halved. There were only 427 people. The heavy cloud cover and mist meant that helicopters couldn't be used that day to move large numbers of searchers to different areas. And in the morning, thunderstorms started rolling in, and it was determined that only the members of the armed forces should be sent out in such treacherous conditions. William said the rain could actually be helpful after it stopped because, quote, it will wash out all the footprints up there now, and if he is moving in the mountains, we will be able to find a new footprint, and they might lead us to him. Williams spent the worst of the storm in the headquarters, studying a map of the area and looking for areas they might have missed. He told the papers, quote, I'm just trying to figure out if there was some way for him to get from where we were over into this other section. At the time, William was still very much convinced Dennis might still be alive. William said, quote, he just disappeared. I believe he's still up there somewhere. He's probably in shock and he may be hurt, but I believe he's holed up and we've just got to find that hole. I was just talking with some of the rangers this morning and they think he may be holed up near the top. I just don't know. There are all sorts of slides up there, but you don't get hurt on them. You slide down about 10 or 15 feet but you end up in the moss and laurel, and it doesn't hurt you. There are cliffs up there, too, but we have searched at the foot of them, and he's not there. While William was pondering his own theories, McCarter started to wonder if the bears had been responsible. He wrote extensively of this theory in his journal. He clarified that the drought had actually been going on the last two years in the summer, causing a massive shortage of acorns. He said this, quote, has resulted in unusual mass migrations of large numbers of animals both within and outside the park. The bear have been particularly hard hit and have become very aggressive in their encounters with hikers and campers who are carrying food. He wrote about an encounter he'd had with a starving bear at Spence Field. They had a hog trap set up, but when they went to check it, there was a bear inside that had eaten all of the corn. Bears normally don't like corn and this bear was in, quote, extremely poor condition and in a very bad mood. They released the bear. 
This was a week before Dennis vanished. He wrote about the unusual number of encounters he'd had with aggressive bears the past year. Quote, I do recall having many encounters with bears in the backcountry this spring. These bears would bluff charge me in an attempt to get me to drop my food pack. My response was to charge them back and deliver a blow to their nose with my stick. This worked 99% of the time with the bear taking off. The other 1% the bear did not bluff, and I would climb a tree until she left. I guess if my stomach had been empty for quite a while, I might take the risk also. He also considered that if a bear had killed Dennis, it may have partially buried his body or covered it with leaves to come back to it later, which could make his remains impossible to find. The search that day was largely unproductive. When the storms let up a bit, a dog team tried to search. But mostly, it was a day for people to sit inside and ponder their theories. On the 24th of June, there were a few more searchers as the conditions were rainy but not as hazardous, and more amateur volunteers were allowed. The total for that day was estimated to be 482. That day, William led a search of the Cades Cove area, focusing on old structures and abandoned buildings where the boy might have taken shelter. William also wandered the Dry Valley area with a bullhorn, checking abandoned buildings and yelling for Dennis. Meanwhile, Ranger Bob Morris said he was having the military double-check the immediate area around where Dennis vanished. Quote, We are more or less letting the armed forces people grid search the Spence Field area. We're starting back over and really combing the immediate area with disciplined forces to try to check every square inch of it. Two more dog teams were brought in to help. Cade's Cove had been reopened to the public, but some roads were still closed due to flooding. Despite the hazardous conditions, some families were already camping in the area. At one point, people spotted a young boy wearing a red t-shirt and off-green shorts walking around the Cade's Cove campground. But when rangers investigated, they found out it was a boy by the name of Michael Devlin, visiting with his family from Kansas. They asked his parents to change his shirt after explaining that they were looking for a lost boy dressed similarly. After his own search of Cade's Cove didn't pan out, William tried using a Ouija board to find Dennis, but had no luck. Mrs. Martin also seemed to be considering the possibility that Dennis could be deceased at this point. Violet said, quote, I've thought about all the possibilities. I'm prepared to accept whatever is found. William spoke with the media to tell visitors to the park to keep an eye out and to check cabins and structures they came across in case he was hiding in one for shelter. When the search concluded that day, there were still around 150 National Guardsmen camped atop Spence Field. General Hugh B. Mott said that he would be meeting with the governor to determine if the National Guardsmen who were still on the search would remain past Wednesday as that was the day they were supposed to be going back on duty. Quote, we've got to consider the law of diminishing returns, but we hate to give up as long as there's any chance at all of finding this boy. Snedden assured the public that even with the military leaving, park officials would still be continuing the search. FBI agent Jim Reike sat in on the daily meeting that night. Snedden said the FBI was looking into the possibility that Dennis had been kidnapped. W.C. Kelly, a dispatcher with the Park Service Communications Center, said that the searchers had considered that kidnapping could be a possibility, but they discussed it and said it had been, quote, pretty definitely discounted. You don't find many screwballs among the mountaineers and the kind of people who come up here to roam these trails. The morning of the 25th, there were 403 searchers in the area but it was largely a day of planning, and many of the troops were being sent home that day. The military made plans to scale back their involvement. They were planning on leaving completely after the following Sunday, and plans were made to scale down operations even more if Dennis was not found by the end of the coming weekend. Though park officials assured the media that the search would continue in some capacity for at least two months. Fry said the efforts were being reduced, because the chance of finding Dennis alive after over 10 days was very slim. 
That day, many of the National Guardsmen left, and the Green Berets were reduced from 71 to 30. William encouraged other family members to go back to their homes and loved ones. Surprisingly, this was the day that the White House wrote back to Mrs. Duncan Martin. Charles G. Carruthers answered on behalf of Nixon. He told her that the president is watching the search very closely and that sending additional men into the area might be counterproductive. They had already tried the approach of numbers. It was time to keep a smaller select team on who knew the area well. He finished with, quote, Please accept our sympathy in this tragic situation. Richard Nixon himself did end up calling the National Park Service a few days later to say that he would be following the search personally and wish them luck. The next day, only 121 people continued the search, and William and Violet finally went home to Knoxville. One helicopter was to remain on duty through the end of the week. George Fry, the superintendent of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, said that they would bring in more SAR volunteers the coming weekend, as well as staff from other parks, and anticipated a large search of around 200 people scheduled for the weekend. Volunteers would still be allowed to search indefinitely, but needed to register so the park could keep track of them. They also would need to provide their own supplies and transportation after the 31st. According to the papers, the only thing of note found that day was a dog carcass, and Snedden later contacted the reporter who wrote of this to correct him. It was a deer that had been chased off of a cliff by dogs. This correction was in an otherwise positive letter meant to encourage the reporter by the name of James Trotter, who wrote an extensive article detailing the entire search in simple enough terms to keep the public interested. The weather was good on the day of June 27th. There were only 68 official searchers, but a student conservation group that had shown up to Cades Cove to camp offered their services and were sent to search and clean up areas that still had markers and ropes and other debris left by the search. Mrs. Martin asked the searchers to pray for Dennis to be found alive, but most of the searchers were resigned to the fact that they were likely looking for remains. McCarter wrote that the search was coming to an end, quote, A great sense of failure and disappointment overwhelms me, but I believe we have done our best with the knowledge, skills, and abilities we possess. On the 28th, there were a few family members still left on the mountain. Dennis's great aunt said that she and her husband would remain on the mountain all summer, if needed. All areas closed off for the search except Boat Mountain Road were reopened. There were 196 men for the day, and Dennis's parents seemed to think that that was more than sufficient. Discouraged by the drop in searchers, Ed Crabtree, a neighbor and friend to the Martins, had called Tennessee Senator. Howard Baker, to ask for 300 federal troops to be sent in to help with the search. When he told the Martins of this, Violet spoke with the military to say that she thought Mr. Crabtree's request was a bit excessive. Violet seemed to think that searchers had done all they could. She said, quote, I don't know how to say thank you to all the wonderful people that helped search for Dennis. That day, searchers followed up on circling vultures and found a dead bobcat. It was the only thing of note found that day. Sunday, the 29th, was the military's last big push in the area. There were 318 men total at the start of the morning, but many of them were scheduled to go home or back to base throughout the day. There were around 159 actively searching the whole day, and it was the last day with the helicopter. The search was completely concentrated on Spence Field, but a small group was on standby to monitor vulture activity. Many National Park Service's employees from out of state or other parks were sent home. The camp at Spence Field was largely shut down. The search turned up nothing. A skeleton crew of 11 park rangers would continue the search for two months. But after that, it might stop entirely, though the Park Service made a point to tell the media that volunteers were still welcome. At 5 p.m., the Martins sat in on the strategy meeting, along with Reiki, Snedden, District Ranger Bob Morris, and Sub-District Ranger Nielsen, to go over their thoughts on the search. 
During the meeting, they went back over the initial disappearance, and William said he was sure it was not more than five minutes that Dennis was gone before they started looking. William reiterated his wish that the psychic leads at least be followed up on if any more come in, as he does believe in that kind of thing. They discussed the possibility of kidnapping, but due to a lack of evidence, the FBI could not launch a full-scale investigation. The reward was up to the family, and the Martins elected to announce a reward of $5,000. McCarter wrote that night, quote, Spence is shut down at 6 p.m. Everything is removed. Three of the park's best man trackers remain on the case. They are brothers Art and Grady Whitehead and J.R. Buchanan. The last helicopter is gone. On July 3rd, McCarter joined the three trackers on their search for the day. He and a small group were hiking near Spence Field when they smelled decay. They radioed in about checking it out, but park officials told him not to worry about it, as they had already found a dead crow in that area. He later said in a 2019 interview with the Asheville Citizen Times, quote, It wasn't a crow. I've smelled a dead crow. This was worse. The spot they were in would have been downwind of Eagle Creek. He later wrote in his book that he wondered if Dennis's remains had been in the area the whole time, and they were just missed during the search. On July 11th, park ranger Mike Myers told the Asheville Citizen Times that, quote, Hopes of finding the boy alive in the park are practically non-existent. He said that he, along with a few rangers and a handful of volunteers, were continuing the search, and said that, quote, Mainly we're trying to run down leads that might conceivably get us some clue of what happened to the boy. We're also getting into some areas that haven't been checked out too well before. Myers seemed to think that kidnapping might have been a possibility. He said they'd discussed it, but didn't have any evidence to support that theory. But he did say, quote, I think if he had been here in the park while the intensive search was on, we'd have run across some sign, but we haven't found a trace. On July 15th, William spoke with the Tennessean. He said, quote, I'm beginning to feel he is not in the mountains. He didn't explicitly say that he thought Dennis had been kidnapped, but he said that there were several reasons he'd come to that conclusion. Quote, First is the time factor. No more than two minutes passed after Dennis disappeared before we began hunting for him. And while Dennis is young, he would have known to find a trail and follow it, not to wander through the brush. The next day, on the 16th, they reported that William had asked numerous papers in cities in North Carolina and Tennessee to please give out Dennis's description and ask readers to keep an eye out. He said he thought it was possible Dennis had wandered out of the Smokies or possibly been taken out of the park. On the 17th, the appeal went out all across the Appalachian area. William had written letters explaining that he believed his son would have been found given the magnitude of the search and expressed his doubt that Dennis would have gotten so lost in the first place. He said Dennis was a very experienced hiker for his age. Quote, He usually was in front of the group picking the trail. He likes the mountains and constantly begs to go to the mountains on weekends. Violet added, quote, Please ask that anyone who might have seen a child fitting his description and seeming to be out of place, please contact us. On July 20th, William spoke with the Tennessean once again. He said he was almost certain that there is someone out there who knows what happened to his boy. I've got nothing to go on, no evidence, but it's a possibility and the only one we have that the boy is still alive. The media spoke with Snedden as well, who says that they are continuing the search, but believes they've done everything they could. The next day, on July 21st of 1969, the news broke that a Tennessee Highway Department engineer by the name of Harold Key had a rather disturbing story to tell that may have been related to Dennis's disappearance. He and his family had been in the park on the 14th, the day Dennis vanished, and may have seen something to point to kidnapping. Key had been hiking with his family in Cades Cove, about 10 miles from where Dennis vanished, according to later estimates. 
His family had been driving around, trying to spot wildlife, and he and his sons decided to venture into the woods a bit. They parked and walked about half a mile or three quarters of a mile. Key said, quote, My sons and I were walking up a creek bed on June 14th looking for bears. We heard a terrible scream. He said in a later interview that it was, quote, a trouble scream, an enormous, sickening scream. We couldn't tell which direction it came from, but it sounded like it came from higher on the mountain to me. In his other interview, he continued with, quote, My wife, who had stayed behind near the car, heard it and thought it was one of our children. After we heard the scream, we walked about 200 yards, and my son said they could see a bear. But it wasn't a bear. It was a man hiding in some bushes. He was definitely avoiding us. In the Kingsport Times, he elaborated on this a bit, saying, quote, I looked across the creek and saw a man behind the bushes. I couldn't tell much about him because he was going down the creek toward the cars and was keeping behind the leaves. He was definitely trying to keep from being seen. Key said that the man they saw walking was acting very suspicious. Quote, I thought maybe he was a moonshiner. They'd ended up in that area because they'd asked a ranger near Cade's Cove for a recommendation about where to go where it was less crowded, as they were trying to spot wildlife. They drove seven to ten miles along a winding back road. Key said that the road was very rough and it might have actually been Boat Mountain Road, which would have put him very close to Spence Field. After passing an elevation marker of 5,000 feet, they found a small pull-off to park their car. There is a white car parked nearby, closer to the woods. Key said of the car, quote, I wouldn't say it was hid, but it was pulled back in the woods. Key said that the car was gone when he and his family got back. He said the man would have needed to circle through the underbrush to get to the car without being seen by him and his family. Key was unsure of what time of day this all took place. He initially claimed he heard it around 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon though he later specified he wasn't really sure what time it was, and it could have been as late as 6.30 or 6.45. He said he and his family didn't start to think it could be related to Dennis until they heard about his disappearance a week later. Quote, We talked about it in the family and decided not to say anything, because so many crackpots call in about things like that. He said that he had not come forward with his story until he saw the statement in the papers from William, speculating about possible kidnapping. He said he started to wonder if the scream he'd heard had been Dennis. It, quote, got to worrying me so I couldn't sleep nights. Park officials immediately expressed doubt that this was related, as the Key family had been hiking in the afternoon, and they had started around Cade's Cove. And they had doubted Dennis could get there so fast. Given Key's unsure time frame, it was even possible he'd heard the scream before Dennis vanished. However, just days later, a disturbing report would come forward that seems to give more credence to Key's story. On July 23rd, Chief Hugh Wells of Greenville, Tennessee State Police called Snedden to tell him about a report he'd gotten. He'd received a phone call from a woman who chose to remain anonymous. She said that about three weeks prior, she'd seen a child resembling Dennis. He was in a white car with Tennessee plates, but she didn't get the number. The child had his head out of the window on Cecil Street in Knoxville. She spotted the driver, who was a bald man in his late 30s or 40s, and there was another child in the car with them. She thought at the time that it looked like Dennis, and when she got home, she looked at pictures of Dennis to be sure but evidently it had taken her three weeks to report it. Chief Wells seemed to think that the report was not reliable and said he was only passing it along so that it did not look bad if the woman went to the media and found that park officials had not discussed the report. It's unclear if the Martins were ever told of this report or if it was ever investigated, but given the dismissal of the state police, it likely was not. On July 27th, the Tennessean wrote about the Rangers' opinion of Harold Key's account. The Rangers said that Key had been near Sea Branch, an area by the Cades Cove campground. He actually led them there when asked to take them to where he heard the scream. Sea Branch is about four or five miles away from Spence Field by air, 
but following hiking trails, it would be seven miles. Given the considerable distance, Snedden said he thought it was unlikely the scream was related, but said they would investigate. William was very intrigued by Key's story. The next day, on July 28th, he wrote a letter to several higher-ups in the park system, as well as Senator Baker and Congressman Duncan, both of Tennessee. The letter reads as follows. I am sure you are aware of the disappearance of our son, Dennis, at Spence Field, June 14, 1969. For the following two weeks, an extensive search was made with thousands of rescue squads, military, and individuals, all searching under the jurisdiction of the park rangers. I feel that this search was quite thorough as I participated in several groups and later checked areas that had been searched by others. Recently, I have become aware of several things that disturb me. 1. Information had been given to the FBI regarding Dennis's disappearance. Certain items which I have discussed with the FBI agents are incorrect. 2. A 27-page summary has been made of the disappearance and search. There are discrepancies in this report. 3. During the past week, I contacted a person, Mr. Keyes, who may have seen a kidnapper. I talked to Mr. Keyes long distance several times, and he volunteered to come to the Smokies. He was contacted and came here to locate the area where he saw the suspicious person. Ranger Ed Widmer and an FBI agent met with Mr. Keyes. No attempts were made to contact me. I found out about 9 p.m. the next night that Mr. Keyes had been here. After calling Mr. Keyes at his home, I found that no explanation was given to him why I wasn't present. At my request, Ranger Widmer showed me the area the next day. This morning, I found in the newspaper that Chief Ranger Lee Snedden gave a complete description of the visit to the local news. The description, complete with map, was given to the press for public knowledge, before I knew that Mr. Keyes was here. Even so, the description is incorrect. The branch described is about one mile away from the place that was visited. The terrain and foliage is completely different. I visited Ranger Snedden today and discussed this situation. His answer was, quote, you have to cooperate with the press. I feel that I should have this sort of information rather than the press. The public has now read this distorted report, and I expect many news stories and versions to be offered. We already have too many stories from people who do not have the correct information. I request any assistance you may give to avoid similar occurrences. Sincerely, William C. Martin. Robert Gibbs had received a copy of this letter and requested updates on how William's complaints were handled. He was later sent the following letter. The only date visible on the letter is August 19th so this may be when it was sent. The letter says that Snedden met with William on August 6th and August 7th to discuss his concerns. The letter says, quote, It is evident to us that Mr. Snedden has resolved the situation satisfactorily on a man-to-man -man basis. The letter said that the FBI did not need to share all relevant information during an ongoing investigation and rejected the idea that the FBI might have incorrect information because that was their area of expertise. In regards to point two, the 27-page report had been hastily put together because a park liaison needed it for a scheduled meeting with the governor. It was finished the night before the meeting and created largely to give the governor an idea of what was going on and was not meant to be a fail-proof source and was not made for Mr. Martin. In response to point three, the letter said the following. The FBI intercepted Mr. Keyes between Nashville and Chattanooga en route to the park to identify the area where he asserted he saw a suspicious person. The FBI took him to the site, and they and the park made no attempt to contact Mr. Martin because the FBI wished to go over the site with Mr. Keyes. It was Mr. Keyes and not Mr. Martin that they were seeking to obtain information from on this occasion. It was inadvertent that the news article regarding the FBI meeting with Keyes was published before Mr. Martin was informed concerning it. Mr. Snedden has explained the circumstances to Mr. Martin and has apologized to him for not informing him in advance of the press release. Upon request, Mr. Snedden had given the story to the press by telephone, and according to him, it was correctly reported as he had given it to them. 
The map referred to was supplied by the paper and not by that park. The matter of the alleged error in the reported location of the site was reviewed with Mr. Martin on that ground during the field meeting on August 7th. As a result, this question has been resolved. William did not have any more documented complaints after this, but it does not appear as if any corrections were done to the story he claimed was wrong, and it didn't look like Rangers made an effort to double-check that Sea Branch was actually the area of the sighting. Nevertheless, the story continued on. On August 16th, the News and Observer spoke with the Martins to see how they were doing. William said that he and his friends spend every weekend searching the Smokies, often focusing on Boat Mountain. William said, quote, I know there is a possibility that he is on the mountain, but there's also the chance that someone picked him up and took him out of the park. By that time, William and Violet had printed 1,200 posters with Dennis's picture and offered a $5,000 reward. With inflation, that would be about $37,200 in today's money. The News and Observer also checked in with Snedden to see about his theories. Snedden maintains that Dennis's body is on the mountain somewhere. Snedden also said the park was running out of funds and may have to end the search soon. They'd kept at least three men assigned to it six days a week and enlisted any volunteers that show up. But it's been two months. He said they would remain open to any leads and ready to investigate. But at this point, they had done all the searching they could. On September 11, 1969, the Johnson City Press Chronicle said the search was coming to an end. Keith Nielsen, the park superintendent, said that the park would officially be ending the search on the 13th. They had spent $65,000 of park funds, which comes to almost $500,000 today. In total, 57 different rescue squads participated. Three top woodsmen stayed on the search for 90 days and occasionally helped direct the volunteers that showed up. Frequently among those still searching was William Martin. With the search officially over, it was time to reflect. Park officials wrote a detailed criticism of the search in order to learn from it. They discussed the need for a safety officer to deal with in-park injuries. They focused on the overall lack of organization, especially in the early days. There was not anyone assigned to keeping a log of all search activities until two or three days into the search. And search leaders were very disorganized from each other. They also didn't properly check that the less experienced volunteers understood all of the equipment and water they would need to bring with them, and many were ill-prepared. They also looked at the way dogs could have been better utilized. They wanted to look into the effectiveness of search dogs after a large rainfall, and make sure to use them more in general during a search, because if the person was still alive, they would pick up a fresh trail, even if the old one had been washed away. Though they did note, that several rescue squads brought dogs with them, the use of dogs was not organized. Though only a few injuries were reported at the time, in 1994, Bob Miller told the Knoxville News Sentinel that, quote, We had dozens of injuries. We never found the boy, but we were carrying people out right and left. The analysis of the search can be found in the NPS Freedom of Information Act request for the case that is freely available online. In that document, there are a few loose ends that were apparently never followed up on. The NPS disclosure document lists several suspicions that the Martins and Park Service had. Apparently, the Martins were suspicious of a contractor named Richard French from Doddridge, Tennessee. Violet was also suspicious of, quote, the lady in Miami. But they don't elaborate on this, or why they were suspicious of this contractor. But whatever the reasons, it appears these suspicions were not followed up on to their satisfaction. The Park Service found the psychic, Billy Nolan, suspicious, as he didn't want any help with food or shelter, but was certain he could find the boy. They also wondered if someone had meant to target Carter's family, the head of the other Martin family, for a kidnapping, then realized they had the wrong boy, but none of these suspicions panned out. A few more leads came in that year. The Knoxville News Sentinel said that in October of 1969, a pair of boys' underwear was found near one of the shelters at Spence Field. But the Martins said they were too big to belong to Dennis. They had been led to the underwear by a psychic, so apparently the park was keeping up on the psychic's leads, just like the Martins wanted. 
On November 16, 1969, Dorothy Montgomery of Newburgh, Indiana, filed a police report. She said that she'd visited the park in September and had spotted a blue canvas sneaker at the Chimney Tops Trail Bridge in the Little Pigeon River. Park officials told the officer who contacted them that there was not a connection. Dennis had been wearing black shoes. As 1969 ended, the Martins kept investigating. On January 15th of 1970, Violet wrote to the Park Service to request the names of everyone who had filed for an extended camping permit in the areas from June 7th to June 15th. She also wanted the names of everyone who had either signed a trail registry or filed for a campfire permit on the following trails. Tremont, Cades Cove, Gregory Bald, Boat Mountaineer, and Big Popular. Snedden sent her back everything they had from the 5th to the 15th, but as they don't require permits from group camping, he did not have any records about that. It appears nothing ever came of Violet's request. On February 7th of 1970, a 16-year-old Boy Scout by the name of Jeffrey Haig vanished in the Smokies. William immediately went back to the Smokies to help look for this lost boy. The search reminded many of Dennis's disappearance, but it was smaller scale because it was winter, and there weren't as many people trained and qualified to handle the deep snow and colder temperatures. On February 18th, a dog team found Haig's body. He had frozen to death. Jeffrey Haig became the first person lost in the Smokies to be found dead. On June 14th of 1970, the Associated Press discussed the year anniversary of Dennis's disappearance. Chief Ranger Ed Widmer said, quote, We feel certain he never left the park. It is a rugged area and most difficult to find anything. Only recently, an airplane that had been missing for months on a flight over the Smokies was found. It took that long to find a plane. You can see how difficult it might be to find a small boy. William does not buy into this. He told the press, quote, The fact there has not been one shred of evidence turned up about Dennis leads my wife and me to believe that he might have gotten out of the park somehow. For months afterward, William took out ads in the local papers asking people to please keep an eye out for Dennis. Though the main search had largely ended, McCarter later told CBS about the search and recalled how dedicated Clyde had been. Quote, Old man Clyde was out searching for that boy. We would meet him on the Appalachian Trail, and he'd search and search one year, two years, four years later, he was still searching. In the previously mentioned article, by journalist James Trotter, titled, quote, Where is the Lost Child Now? The journalist explored where the Martins and Snedden had ended up on their theories after the search ended. Violet doubled down on the kidnapping theory. She said, quote, If he is on the mountain, then he is for sure dead. But we believe that someone may have picked him up and taken him out of the park. If that is true, then he may be alive right now. Snedden seems to think that he is somewhere on the mountain. Quote, lacking any evidence indicating otherwise, I would say that he must be up there somewhere. For people who don't know the area, this is hard to understand, but with thick undergrowth, laurel, and rhododendron hells, you could walk within three feet of a body and still not see it. If masses could have found him, we would have found him. If individuals could have found him, we would have found him. With that, the story fell out of the media for 15 years until a disturbing new lead came forward. In July of 1985, a ginseng hunter that McCarter knew well contacted him to tell him about a possible lead. He said that years prior, he and a man who had chosen to remain anonymous were illegally harvesting ginseng in the Big Hollow area of the park. This was near the heavily searched Haw Gap area. They were following a stream, and as they approached a small waterfall, they noticed several bones scattered around the ground. The bones looked to have been freshly uprooted by a fallen tree. The men quickly recognized the skeleton as human, and there was a child-sized skull clearly visible. The man did not tell anyone about this at the time, because he did not want to be prosecuted for poaching ginseng. He had decided to come forward years later, as he felt guilty. McCarter contacted the rescue squad, and about 30 men searched the hollow, 
but didn't find anything. The child skeleton would have been about three and a half miles from where Dennis vanished, and then the direction of the Eagle Creek shoe prints. Once again, the story fell out of the media until the 50-year anniversary in 2019. Several articles came out, and many of them focused on what could have been done better during the search and the lessons learned. Dwight McCarter said that there were likely too many volunteers and that the large number actually hampered the search. Quote, All those people, that's a lot of foot traffic. All those trucks, we searched and searched and searched. Something should have been found. But you have to know what to look for. Get just a few of us trackers in first and give us a chance. Clay Jordan, the park superintendent, told the Tennessean that, quote, what transpired there was one of the largest searches at that time in American history. It can be hard enough to find someone who is off trail. Instead of searching for the subject, you need to be searching for clues. But they were just trying to put people everywhere. So you had a lot of mud, you had a lot of trampling. Is that clue left behind by your subject or by a searcher? We need more clues and fewer people. Park spokesman Bob Miller said that nowadays searchers are much more nuanced. Quote, we always try to start out with a small contingent of trackers and our best people for sleuthing. You have to do that before you send 50 people off and pollute the evidence. The amount of people getting lost in parks is always going up with the population, so it's important to keep refining the process and improving it. Park officials usually need to find and rescue between 30 and 70 people a year. Bob Miller said, quote, I guess what a lot of people don't understand is this is a wilderness. They just don't realize how far from civilization you are here. People get in trouble by doing dumb things. The search tactics appear to be working well. To date, only four other people have gone missing in the Smokies and never been found. Search and rescue officers all over the world now study the Dennis Martin case to see what worked and what didn't. They realize that the numbers overall were more of a detriment than a help. And nowadays, only around 100 people are used for a large search. Search and rescue teams around the world actually reenact the search. Clay Jordan said, quote, At the time, it's a story of compassion, of an entire region coming behind the family to really try to find Dennis. The longer-term legacy of Dennis Martin is that contribution towards helping to make it so much less likely of such a search being necessary again. Though the search is known across the world, it has been so long that it's doubtful any answers will ever be found. Clay Jordan told the Asheville Citizen Times, quote, I think it's virtually impossible that we will ever know what happened to Dennis Martin. Human nature being what it is, we want to have an explanation, but it's become one of the enduring mysteries of the Smokies. Music is provided by Hex System. Major sources for this episode include Reddit, the Knoxville News Sentinel, and the Tennessean. For a full list of sources, as well as links to our sponsors and contributors, please see our show notes. Please rate or review on your chosen app and follow us on Twitter or Instagram at CompulsionCast to stay up to date on our latest episodes and news. See you in two weeks.